morning will make a start. Hopefully you can all hear me. A few rumbles still going on. That might be better. Good morning. Uh, very warm welcome. My name is Bert Dean. I'm one of the elders here. It's wonderful once again that we get to meet on uh, a Sunday. In fact, we were just praying, um, some of the, uh, the men out there earlier on, just praying about them. And just actually how wonderful it is that each week we can come and spend time together in fellowship uh, without, at the moment, without fear of persecution, being able to sing God's praises freely without any real fear from the authorities, which is a real blessing that we have that many Christians around the world don't have. Um, just something to reflect on this morning. Perhaps this is your first time here. If it is a very warm welcome to you, uh, we'd love to get to know you better. We're going to have tea and coffee after the service, serve just through there. So please do stick around, say hello to me or to uh, Ian and Hilary on the welcome at the back there. But do come and say hello before you rush off. It'd be lovely to get to know you better. I'm sure, like me, most of you will know that today is Mothering Sunday or Mother's Day. Uh, a day where perhaps uh, we reflect on the mothers who are or have been in our lives. And whilst obviously for, for many mothers the focus is on them, I want the focus obviously to be on God, our great God, who has blessed us in many ways. And just looking through the Bible, there are a number of pages, a number of passages where uh, mother is used in, in a comparison with, with who God is and uh, parts of God's character. And I was just going to read a few of those to you, ones which uh, perhaps you, you aren't familiar with. I suddenly seem to get very loud there. Um, so, Isaiah 49. So this is in uh, Isaiah where they're talking about the restoration of Israel. And you have Zion, so God's holy city, saying, The Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. And the response is, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget. Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. You know, we've got a great God who, who knows us and loves us. Even if a mother might forget her child, God is not going to forget his people. And in Isaiah 66, a bit further on, um, we have in Isaiah 66 verse 12 for thus says the Lord and this is, this is at a point where it's talking about rejoicing with Jerusalem talking about new heavens and a new earth for thus says the Lord behold I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream and you shall nurse you shall be carried upon her hip and bounced upon her knees as one whom his mother comforts so I will comfort you you shall be comforted in Jerusalem just a wonderful image again of a God who loves us, cares for us, comforts us and, and just holds us close to him. And then obviously in the New Testament you might be familiar with where the passage in, in Luke where Jesus laments over Jerusalem. And uh, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered, gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. Again, just an image there of Christ, just really just wanting to bring his people under his wings to care for them and, and watch over them. Yeah, this is the God that we, we serve, that we love, that we can know through his word. And this, this morning, uh, Trevor Archer is going to open God's word to us about role models and what we should be like as his people. And so we'll be praying for uh, Trevor shortly before he comes to speak to us. But I just wanted those things to be in our mind as we come to our time together. Uh, I'm going to open in prayer. So let's just uh, close our eyes and commit this time to the Lord. Almighty God, we thank you that we can approach you at any time of the day. Day or night, we can come before you. We thank you, Lord, that you are a loving Father who we can approach with our cares and our concerns, and you bring comfort and healing. Lord, we know that in our lives we might be struggling with so much and, and feel far from that comfort and healing, but Lord, you are always with us and you are faithful and true and you will bring that to be so lord this morning we pray that you'll help us to have our eyes firmly fixed on you to see more of who you are that you may teach us through your word what you would have us be that we may live lives that honor and glorify you and in our time now lord may we bring our praises to you through song through conversation and and teach us from your word we pray that we may be better equipped to go out and declare your goodness to others in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing two songs. Um, the first song, I just wanted to read some of the lyrics because I appreciate, you know, we, we all come in 
on a Sunday morning, perhaps some with joyful hearts, some with heavy hearts. Um, and one of the verses just really struck me, which is, Come those whose joy is morning sun, and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won, and those struggling in the fight. For his perfect love will never change, and his mercies never cease. But follow us through all our days with a certain hope of peace. So let's stand together as a church, and let's sing these two songs together. Please stand, church. standing church as we uh, sing Be Thou My Vision. Sorry, Karen's just reminded me of something. <laughs>
just a few family notices to give out. Uh, next Sunday evening will be our prayer and praise at Ashley Baptist Church. So please come along. That will be on the uh, uh, email that comes out each week. But that is next Sunday. So please just pop that in your diary if it's not there already. And also, um, just one thought. You might have noticed a number of our people wearing GCL hoodies, um, which is uh, great to see. If uh, you still need to pay for those, please speak to Jill. Annabelle, Olivia, um, speak to them after the service. Um, but wonderful, again, just as a, as a church family, we can have things like that um, and be a witness as we're out and about and we pray there'll be opportunities from that. Um, I'm going to invite John up with Trevor. He's going to interview Trevor on Trevor's current um, plans for the future. So John's come up now, Trevor, and then, and then um, Andrew will come up and do our reading. Is one on? Yes. No? Yeah, brilliant. Hi Trev, good to see you. And you. Thank you so much uh, for coming this week. It's enabled me to have a couple of days off, so I appreciate that. Um, uh, some, many of you will know Trevor. Uh, Trevor has been living and ministering just up the road in Chesterton for how long? Well, I was converted there when I was about just over 16, so that's 60 years ago. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, some of you will know that Trevor was pastor at uh, Chestington Church and then has moved on into a role with the FIC as one of the directors there. Yeah, maybe Trevor, you could just summarize your ministry for the last few years, what, what you've seen, what you've done. Um, just a, a quick summary, just so we can hear a bit more about that. That'd be great. Okay. Well, if I just focus on um, the FIC bit, uh, FIC, the church here, Grace Church, belongs to a fellowship of independent evangelical churches. It's a bit of a mouthful but it tries to say what's on the label kind of thing. And uh, there are 650 of these churches nationwide, and the idea is that um, we are a fellowship. We can do more together than we do on our own. Uh, so when I was invited to become one of the uh, directors there, uh, my first role was to be a training director. And the idea of that was to create both funds and a route into ministry for men and women from our churches that wasn't really existing. Now, this man actually was one of the first beneficiaries of that fund. So uh, Grace has directly benefited from that fund for the generosity. Particularly the generosity, there's one couple in the north of England have been incredibly generous toward that fund. Over the years, I think over two million pounds has been put into that fund and been uh, given to um, both individuals, but also churches, because there's no point training people if there's nothing for them to go to, and churches often need that just kickstart, that bit of help uh, to get a ministry going. So we will give twice as many to the church as we, w we would give to the uh, individual. But in God's goodness, I think there's about 130, 140 people <coughs> pass through that. So that's what I did for the first seven years. In the last few years, I've been uh, focused on London, and that's been a great joy. Uh, there are 80 FIC churches within the M25. Are you within the M25? Not a, no, not You're here. Not, uh, oh, Leatherhead yeah. just sneaks yeah, just inside right. the M25. Okay. So if you were, there'd be 81. But there's 80 uh, churches, FIC churches within London, and um, they're all sorts of shapes and sizes. And as you'd appreciate, some of them in the inner city areas, quite small, tough areas to be in, others more in suburban settings. Uh, my wife Val and I helped uh, start a church called Grace, not Grace, Globe Church in central London. Uh, and my role really was just to get people together, get talking to each other, getting to know each other, and uh, on the back of that, do stuff together, whether it was evangelism, whether it was training, whether it was actually planting or revitalizing a church. So um, that's, been, that's been a great joy, and that ended on the 29th of February. Yeah. So uh, last Thursday I went to uh, Trevor's final Hurrah! At, uh, at, with with the uh, FIC London leaders in in L London, and it was a wonderful time actually of lots of people honouring Trevor's ministry. And as Trevor said, I have been a beneficiary of that. I remember meeting you. I think it was Waterloo Station or Paddington. I can't remember uh, many years ago. Uh, as I was thinking about going into ministry, I was pointed to Trevor as the guy to go to to think about the next steps for that. And uh, yeah, well here we are, sort of twelve. I think twelve years later. So mm, wonderful. Um, that is wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the, the FIC we're, we're uh, hopefully familiar with the sorts of things they do. Um, 
Trevor, what are you moving on to do now? You've, you've finished that role, but you, you don't yeah. stop, do you? So no. what, what are you doing now? Um, I'm primarily going to give my time, probably two days a week, um, three Christian businessmen uh, in the city of London, uh, about 18 months ago, set up a fund. Uh, it's called the Psyker Fund, it's quite strange, but actually it's after the incident in John 4, the woman of Samaria, the woman of Psyker. And the idea of the fund was to provide, again, it's a, it's a training thing, to provide uh, monies for the training of men and women from economically deprived and ethnically unreached areas of Britain. Well, that, that's, that's massive. Um, but the reality is the church in those places tends to be quite thin on the ground. Uh, and so, again, how do men and women in those situations access funds to help them trained to be gospel ministers in their locality, whether that's pastors, women's workers, evangelists, uh, youth workers, and so on. So um, these three men asked me to kind of set that up um, in terms of getting it organized and un under underway. Uh, so I gathered a group of eight men and women around the country who are what we call practitioners, who are working in those areas. Uh, together, we act as an advisory board. We, we look at the applications that come in. We make recommendations. And in God's goodness today, it's gone much quicker than we thought. Um, in God's goodness today, over £1.3 million has been committed to the training of, of, of nearly 80 men and women around the country in all sorts of ethnic groups, uh, in economically deprived areas. So last weekend I was down in um, <coughs> South Wales. There's a church there, quite a remarkable church. Um, if, if you know anything about South Wales, it's an area that once knew great blessing in the gospel, but today it's, there's a paucity of witness there. And it's also an area of huge economic deprivation, especially in the valleys. And uh, eight years ago, uh, a man went to pastor a church in a place called Nodfa uh, and near Pontypool. There were literally six elderly ladies left in the congregation. And he describes how when he would get up on a Sunday to preach, they would be on the back row and he'd be down the front. I mean, it only happens in a church, doesn't it? Anyway, in God's goodness, eight years on, there are 150 people in that church Half of them are young men under the age of 35, young is my perspective, <laughs> under the age of 35, who are recovering alcoholics, drug addicts, with, often with prison records, but have been converted. And so the Psycho Fund is actually putting significant funding into the training of uh, four of those men and they run a Saturday Bible school, rather like the Genesis thing that we did at Hook and Chesington years ago and with Fetcham. And um, the, the exciting thing is that, uh, the idea is that at, at least two of those guys will then go and plant a church in the next valley in three or four years' time. So that's just a kind of example of it, but immense needs out there, um, but great opportunities as well. Great, that sounds fantastic. If you'd like to hear a bit more about that, Trevor, are you going to hang around for a couple of minutes oh, afterwards? Absolutely, I'll yeah. be here for Great. coffee. So Trevor will be here. If you want to hear more about that, then please do speak to him afterwards. One last, one last question. Um, can you just, what's the biggest thing you've learned from all your years of ministry? Um, well, I often say this, it's not to take yourself too seriously. Uh, I think that's a, that's a huge <laughs> lesson. So often people in, in, in paid Christian ministry take themselves too seriously. Now, I don't mean to be flippant, but I, I, I mean this. We take the gospel incredibly seriously, that you take the gospel with uttermost, uttermost seriousness. But please don't take yourself too seriously, because at the end of the day, we are fallen sinners, and we're redeemed by the grace of God, and daily we need that grace, and daily we need the patience of God. So I'm always... Amaze. I, I love that quote of John Newton, apparently in the, in the last year of his life, he said, two things I've learned. Uh, one, I am a great sinner. <coughs> two, God is a great saviour. Yeah. And you never stop learning that, do you? So I think that's probably, yeah. Very helpful. Thank you very song. much. Great. Thank you, Trevor. Not we look forward all. to hearing your preaching later. What are we doing now, Bert? Another song. Great. Oh, oh reading. Sorry. Yes, you did say. Reading, reading this morning is taken from Titus, 
chapter 2. <clears throat> so that's Titus chapter 2, and we're going to be starting at verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders, slanderers, or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Thank you, Andrew. We're now going to uh, stand and sing, yet not I, but Christ in me. So please do stand where the musicians lead.
when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, no time but through Christ to me. Yet no time but through Christ to me. Yet no time but through Christ to me. to have a seat. Um, I'd invite the Sunday school teachers to head out now, if they're doing that, uh, creche leaders as well, and then the children can head out as well. So if they want to go, that'd be great. I'm just going to read from Psalm 103 whilst they go out, before Nick comes and leads our time in prayer. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I'm going to invite Nick up, who's going to lead our time in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Please join me for a time in prayer now. Dear Father God, we have come together this morning to be present for you and to be a united body in Christ, to celebrate you and to learn more from you. With our limited understanding, we try to imagine with all the true majesty of a God over all things, a God that is all wise, holy and good, but we fall short. Please help us by revealing yourself more clearly so that we can all be truly humbled, bend our knees, worship, and fear you as the word says. We ask, Lord, that you do this to help rid us of any pride, conceitedness, arrogance, or vanity that separates us from you, your son, or separates us from having godly relationships with each other. Lord, we know we have all sinned and fallen short over this past week. Help us to be fully convicted of our sin so that we can have repentant hearts and so that we can turn to your Son on the cross. In Christ alone resides the remedy to our sin, so help us turn that conviction for our sins into love, relief, and thankfulness to our loving Saviour, Jesus Christ, who came down to this earth for one reason, to save us from ourselves. Help us manifest that love and thankfulness towards our fellow man through all types of good works, not to earn favor, 
but motivated through our love of Jesus. We thank you that through the power of Jesus' death, being a ransom paid for many, for us, that through faith and repentance we are washed clean, and that at the right time we will stand before your throne. Lord, as we think about things that please you, we bring Wycliffe Bible Translators to you, our mission partner, and an organization working for the last 70 years across 70 countries tirelessly with a vision to make your word, the Bible, available in many different languages. We pray, Lord, that you continue to bless them with volunteers and funding so that their work continues strongly across the lands they're in, but also new areas where approximately one and a half billion people do not have access to the Bible. We pray over the teaching we will be hearing today, Lord, through Trevor. There is such a need for godly leadership and mentoring from godly politicians, institutional leaders, corporate leaders, to school leadership and parenting, which can have a profound impact on people of all ages. Please give strength to all Christian leaders and raise up new godly leaders to bring your word, wisdom and salvation to many, many people. We ask this so that many may use their gifts fully and towards your glory, but also so that many will experience the peace of being under, under godly stewardship. We think particularly of the areas with ongoing war and conflict and ask that you show the affected people's mercy and convict any leaders of their evil. Lead them to repentance and a spirit of reconciliation and peace. Closer to home, we pray for our elders as they meet this evening, that you will help guide their discussions and any decisions they make to be wise ones and pleasing to you. Lord, we thank you again for the wonderful staycation weekend, um, which was full of fun, learning, and fellowship, um, which we all shared together. Thank you that we had the meaning of the five solas open to us in a way that really helps us hold fast to your gospel. Help us really absorb the full meaning of God's word alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, and for God's glory alone, so that we can be your messengers of hope into the communities in and around Leatherhead. We bring all these things to you, our almighty Father, joyful in the knowledge that you are the all-powerful creator of all things, that anything is possible if it's your will, that you are faithful to your people, and that we have hope set in Christ Jesus, your Son. Amen. We're going to stand and sing by faith, and then Trevor will open God's words to us. So please do stand. Please stand, church.
Well, good morning again. It is always a joy to be here at Grace Leatherhead. And uh, it's a particular joy, uh, our friends from Uruguay and other parts of Spain who are here. Uh, I'm afraid you haven't got a transcript uh, of my message, but I hope um, that you can glean something of what we're going to look at. We're going to be thinking about, as uh, Bert has already flagged up, we're going to be thinking about role models, role models. And so, would you turn with me to uh, that little letter in the New Testament, Titus. Titus and chapter 1, we're going to be particularly in chapter 2. And as you do that, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's living and active. We pray by the Holy Spirit you would plant it in our hearts and our lives and our will and our actions and our speech that it would reflect what you call us to be. Come help us now, we pray in the Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. That uh, one own preacher of the last century, still alive today, Dick Lucas, who for many years uh, ministered at St. Helens uh, in Bishopsgate in London, tells the story of going to a, a minister's fraternal. And at the end of it, the guy leading it said, uh, would somebody like to lead the next session? We're going to do it next time we meet on prayer. And Dick said, at that very moment, everybody in the room took a sudden interest in their shoes. All the heads went down. They started examining their shoelaces because nobody wanted to get caught. Nobody wanted to be revealed as a bit of a fraud. So they all kept their head down. So... The guy instead said, well, turn to the person next to you and tell them about one of the people that have been part of your journey to Christ or have kept you on the road in following Christ. Dick said, suddenly the room became alive. Everybody was animated and talking to the person next to them about that person in their life may have been more than one, whom God had placed there and had had a profound effect upon them. 
We all need role models. And the Bible uh, understands that and provides for that. And this little letter of Titus, uh, in, especially in chapter 2, really focuses down on the importance of being a role model. Now, if we're a Christian, we are a role model. If we're not a Christian, we're a role model. Our very lives, our actions, our speech, the way we relate to people, model something about us. Our values, the things that we think are important. We are all instinctively, without realizing it, a role model to those around us. Now here in Titus, in this letter of Paul to, to, the, to the church there at, at, in Crete, Paul is wanting to talk about the power of a Christian role model. Be it an older man, an older woman, a younger man, a younger woman. I'll leave you to decide in which category you are. But you see, the letter begins in chapter 1, verse 1. He talks about the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And the rest of the letter, in a way, is unpacking that. It's saying, if you know Christ, if you know the truth, then it leads to a way of life that puts on display what it means to have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. What you believe, in other words, must be shown in how you behave. And the issue isn't simply about good behaviour, because you don't have to be uh, a Christian to be somebody who lives a, a moral life, a good life, and so on. The whole point of this for the Christian is the good behavior, the godliness is meant to point Jesus to the Lord, point people to the Lord Jesus. That's the whole point of it, that they should have in their lives put on display what it means to be a Christian. That's where this letter's going. That's what he's, what he's aiming at. It's not simply that Christians should be nice, well-behaved uh, people, good citizens, and so on. It's all that accompanied by their good works, it should impact the society around them. So suddenly, you see, if we're a Christian, this is talking to us. Whatever our age, whatever our gen uh, gen gender, this is speaking to us this morning. Godly role models. Now, there's a lot to get through, so I'm going to go straight to chapter 2. In chapter 2, do you notice he talks to older women, older men, younger women, younger men. But we've got to understand, before we do that, a little bit about the culture there in Crete. Some of us, I haven't, but some of us may have been on holiday to Crete uh, in, in recent years. Well, if you travel back to first century Crete, you wouldn't go on holiday there. Because when uh, you look down in chapter 1, it, it says this, in chapter 1, verse 12, one of your own prophets, one of their own prophets, Cretan prophets, has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Now imagine that on the holiday brochure. You really want to go to this place because there, that you can't believe a word that they tell you. They're all on the make, they're all liars. They're evil, something nasty is likely to happen to you, and they're just lazy gluttons. You'll never get anything done there. I mean, that's an incredible thing to write about a culture, isn't it? But you see, Crete was notorious for that lifestyle. That's what he's saying. This is what this island was known for. It was infamous for this. But then when you stop and think about it, and you travel forward 21 centuries, and you think about where we are today, in the suburbs of London, and the culture that we live in, hey, suddenly, this isn't too far, is it, from the culture that you and I live in day after day. A culture that's, uh, that hangs light to the truth, that says there's, there's only your truth, there's no definitive truth, there's no absolute truth. So you say whatever you want to say that advances you, whether it's true or not. A society that's increasingly violent, evil, Evil brutes. It seems a strong, strong description, doesn't it? But it's reflective of a culture that leaves God out of the picture. Lazy gluttons. Our world, our country, our culture is obsessed with food and self. 
and serving self. So suddenly this letter has incredible contemporary application to us. Now that's the culture he was writing to. And he was saying, but it's not going to stay like that. The gospel's come to this island and it's going to change things. And it's going to change things through Christians. Ordinary men, women, boys and girls living for the Savior. That's how God's going to change this culture. That's why I've left you on the island of Crete, says Paul to Titus, that you can appoint uh, godly leaders there who in turn will train the church, will train the men, train the women to live the kind of life, the godliness that comes from knowing the truth. So that's the setting to it. But let's now go to chapter 2 and think about the older men, the calling to older men, chapter 2, verse 2. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Some years ago, the broadcaster Anna Ford uh, made a documentary about men. She interviewed 120 men from all walks of life, from judges to janitors to caretakers, from mechanics to miners. And at the end, she said she felt rather depressed. Why, said the interview, uh, the journalist who was writing this article, why is that? Well, she said, not one man I interviewed had any real sense of purpose in life. Not one man I interviewed had any real sense of purpose in life. Pressed as to what she thought was lacking in their lives, she said, it seems to me that their outer man and their inner man need to come together, by which I suppose I mean they need to find God. Now I don't know if Anna Ford is a Christian or not, but actually interviewing all those men, seeing the vacuousness of their life, recognizing that their outer life and their inner life needed to come together, what they needed was God their creator, who made them, who knew how they should be ticking. Now, that's a pretty good reflection of what Paul says here in verse 2. He's talking about when a man becomes a Christian, those two things actually begin to come together. Sound in faith, love, and endurance are inner things. The outer bit is temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled. Do you see? The outer man and the inner man coming together. You see, to be a Christian is actually to be in a one-to-one -one relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it begins in the inner heart. It begins uh, in the inner man as the gospel grips us and changes us from the inside out. And it's summed up in this familiar trilogy here in the New Testament. You often find it expressed as faith, hope, and love. Here it's expressed as faith, hope, and love and endurance. <coughs> what does faith do? Well, quite simply, it puts us back in contact with God. It brings us into relationship with the God who's made us, the God who knows us, the God who loves us, the God who saved us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might live life as he wants us to do. Faith is not some abstract thing. Faith is trust in God. In the New Testament, in the Bible, when it talks about faith, it's not talking about something airy-fairy. I always remember a few years ago, the dear lady who said to me, Oh, Trevor, I wish I had your faith. What she meant by that, she thought it was something like the, the, the measles that you might catch. You know, people often think like that, don't they? Oh, it's nice for you to have that faith. Faith is not something I conjure up. Faith is something God creates in my heart. It's a gift of grace. And it brings me into relationship. It means I put my trust in him. I follow him. And that's where it starts. Faith puts a man in touch with the Lord Jesus. And it opens up the possibility. This is a remarkable thing, isn't it? We can have a one-to-one -one with the Lord Jesus every day through his word. Faith puts us in contact with God's wisdom, God's perspective. It addresses every major question in life. And in the context of men, it talks about how we are to live. 
talks about how I'm to feel when I'm crushed, when I feel rejected. At those times, it points me to a saviour who's been rejected and crushed. You see, all the time it's touching our lives. It shows me how to be a good husband if I'm married, or a good father if I'm a father, or a good friend, or a good employee. It touches every area of life. It comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's love. What does love do? Well, those of you who love musicals and uh, Lloyd Webber's uh, musicals, love changes Everything. There you go. You just revealed yourself. All those that love the music. You love the music in this church. We came to the, um, the, the what's it called? Roots of Jazz. Roots of Jazz. Roots of Jazz. Sorry, my hearing is going. Roots of Jazz. That was brilliant. Music is a great gift, isn't it? Musicals. Love changes everything. It does. Not the kind of love that Lloyd Webber was thinking of, purely romantic love. But to know the love of God, which is what Paul's talking about, changes everything. Every perspective on my life is now controlled and conditioned by God's love to me. Who am I? What's my identity? What's my purpose? What's my value? It's all conditioned by the love of God. I am who I am because of the love of God. I don't have to earn it. I am loved with an everlasting love and cannot earn it but I am loved as I've always wanted to be loved and when you begin to grasp the immensity of the love of God and at its heart the sacrifice that true love means true love is other person centered then it begins to affect how you think not only about yourself but people around you you see faith puts us in contact with God it puts our trust in him to know the love of God changes everything nothing has changed the world like the love of God and the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary and it goes on changing the world today it does change everything but its source is God himself and that love says the Bible has been shed abroad in our hearts as a Christian life can never be the same love has changed everything because I am loved with everlasting love. What's my value to God? He loved me and gave his son for me. Can I have greater value than that? Can I have a greater purpose in life than that? It's impossible, isn't it? But knowing that, wow, everything is changed. Knowing what I'm like, he still loves me. That quote I mentioned earlier in the interview about John Newton, two things I've learned. Here he is, an old man, his 87th year. Two things I've learned. I'm a great sinner. I have a great saviour. And If you're a Christian, if you're an older Christian, an older man, you know that. You know that. You say, why do I keep struggling with that sin? I'm I'm just rubbish at that. I'm a great sinner. Yeah, but you have a great saviour. And he's going to change you. He's not going to give up on you. So Paul's saying, in the inner man, you need to know this. You need to know this. Then, of course, there's endurance. Well, what's that? Well, always in the Bible, it's about the finishing line, isn't it? Hebrews 12. It's about the end. It's about the hope that is ours. We live by that hope. If you've got that hope, it transforms everything in life. I was just thinking as we're praying about that, that brother who's been badly injured in in an accident last night from Cannon Court. Uh, Hopefully, he's, 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 he's going to be fine. But if you're in that situation... Starkly, your hope comes into focus, doesn't it? What is my hope when things befall me, as we say? It is this, that I'm loved with an everlasting love, that Jesus is going to get me across the finishing line, that I have this hope, the hope of a new heaven, a new earth, a new body, a new realm of existence. It's incomparable. That's my hope. So Paul, you see, is saying that this inner life shapes everything it will shape your character and your relationship with God will then begin to overflow into your outer life temperate worthy of respect self-controlled it's simply a picture of mature Christian character isn't it there's nothing wimpish there's nothing narrow here it's just wonderful I don't know who some of your heroes are in your Christian life Mine are generally those older saints. Now, I'm an, 
I'm getting there, I realize. But it's those men and women who, when I was younger, had just kept going, just kept loving Christ. They were never up front. They, 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 would, they wouldn't know what to do if they were up front. They didn't aspire to that. But in their, if I could call it their ordinary God, godliness, in their love, in their patience, in their acts of kindness, they had a profound effect. I think of, to name somebody, uh, Ray Smith at Chesington. He's gone to be with the Lord now. But he was like a dad to me. Even though I was 40, 40 45, 50, if there was an issue in a church, I wanted to talk over with him. I'd go round Friday afternoon and see Ray. Ray was an old cockney. He'd left school at 13. He literally had been born in a pub because his parents were publicans. He came to know Christ when he was about 60. The transformation in his life was incredible. But he became a godly role model. It's a wonderful thing to see. I'm sure if you're a Christian, you've got somebody, someone like that in your life. But then think about the younger men here. Verses uh, 6 to 8. Encourage the younger men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, do you ever play... You don't. You're far too sensible to play this game. But do you ever play the thing, if I wrote the Bible, what would I say at this point? So, okay, he's speaking to the older men, he's speaking to the older women, he's going to speak to the younger women, he's going to speak to the young men. Right, this is it. I better get a couple of pots of paint here because there's a lot to say. And then you come to the Bible and you think, is that all you've got to say, Paul? <coughs> Teach them to be self-controlled? <laughs> there's so, so much more to say, Paul. Don't you realise? That's ridiculous. A few words, teach them to be self-controlled. If you've got a self-controlled young man, what have you got? What have you got? Well, I won't ask you personally. I know a few people by name here, so I could. But you've got a walking miracle, haven't you? You have a walking miracle. And especially if you're a Cretan, if you're a young man growing up in that culture, imbibing it every day, it's being bombarded at you every day through adverts, through television, I know they didn't have it at the time, but we have, and it's a very similar culture. What have you got if you've got a younger man who is self-controlled? You have a walking miracle. You have a walking miracle. Because it means, we know what it means in Bible terms, don't we? What's the term self-controlled? What does it trigger in our mind if we're a Christian and we know the Bible of it? Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives and where does it end up? It's one fruit remember, it's not nine fruits, it's one one fruit described in different ways but where does it end up? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, peace. Where does it finish? Self-control. It finishes self-control doesn't it? Self-control. It's shorthand you see. Paul, Paul does under God know what he's doing doesn't he? The Holy Spirit has inspired him correctly after all. If you've got a person who's under self-control, whose control are they under? They're under God's control. That's the point, isn't it? It's the fruit of the Spirit in their life that increasingly God is the dominant force. God is the dominant voice in their life. And their life, however perverse the culture, is being changed by the Word of God so that they live counterculture to the glory of God. But we all need encouragement, don't we? And encourage the young men. Now, one really practical way we can do this, and I just want to speak to the older guys here for a minute, and I'll let you decide. Actually, we're all older guys in one way or another, aren't we? Because we can always find somebody who's younger than us. The power of an older person taking an interest in you is enormous. This applies equally to women, by the way. An older person taking me under their wing, perhaps meeting with me to read the Bible once a week or once a fortnight, just for, just for an hour together. Somebody who can 
share and empathize, somebody who's open and frank with me to say, you know, I still struggle with those sins. I might be a lot older than you, but I still struggle with that. I found this to be helpful. That mentoring, that one-to-one in the Bible is a very powerful thing. It's, it's how we help one another. What about, guys, is there somebody that you could just take under your wing? You may be doing it already, if so that's great, but I imagine there's quite a few more. And you think, oh, I could never do that. Do you know it's the easiest thing in the world? All you've got to do is not be a Bible student, but just open the Bible together, meet up each week, decide you're going to read through something, whether it's an epistle or a gospel. And as you do that, just, just a chapter, a short passage each week, talk about what it's teaching you, what its implications are, how we can pray for one another. Some years back, we uh, actually tried to organize that at Chesington. Well, we not tried to, we did. We actually had the elders and the deacons, they all took one younger man under their wing. The power of that, the impact of that was enormous. Not publicly necessarily, but just in the lives of those younger men. And as the, as the guys did it, they realized, actually, I could do this. As a, as, a, as a young man, I could take, and this is where it works, isn't it? I could take a very young teenager under my wings. Because if I'm a teenager, who do I look to? I look to the guys that are about late teens or early 20s. For them to take an interest in my life is so powerful. Just do one-to-one. The ministry to younger men. Set them an example, he says. Verse 7, of doing good. Show them what it is, what Christianity with clothes on looks like. Explain the gospel, verses 7 and 8. The gospel has got its own inherent power to shape, to mold, to change us. But it needs to be applied into our lives. So just get together, open up the Bible. There's all sorts of resources. Pastor, your pastor will help you uh, with this to point you in the right direction. All sorts of age you can get to do that. But that's the way the role modeling goes on. Well, I'm sure my time has nearly gone, I think, but I'm going to quickly move on to the ladies. It is, after all, Mothering Sunday. Here's a call to older Christian women, verse 3. Understanding the culture, I hope you won't, ladies, be offended by this. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. So important, isn't it? We understand the culture. If Paul was writing uh, to another church, another culture, another, he would, he would identify different things. He's being very specific to the culture here because he knows, actually, all of us are part of that culture. And we, uh, whether we realize it or not, we live and breathe, we're bombarded by it, day by day and we can unwittingly allow that to set our agenda not the gospel not godliness so as with the men so with the women it's about character be reverent in the way that you live the bible is all about substance not not just uh, style which our culture is so full of isn't it be gentle and humble in heart that flows from Christ, isn't it? He says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Here's the kind of heroine that God calls mature, older Christian ladies. Now, by mature, actually, the Bible isn't necessarily totally age-related. We can be a mature 25-year-old woman or man and be uh, as a Christian. We can be in our 50s and not really mature. That's a frightening thing, isn't it? Because we've not allowed the gospel to impact us at the everyday life, everyday level. So maturity is actually a maturity in Christ. It's growing as a Christian. It's understanding uh, who I am. And it's rejoicing and reveling in that. But here, for the older women, what is it? In their culture, he said, get your tongue under control, not slanderous. Now, Paul isn't saying that it's only women who gossip. But he's simply flagging up a prevailing culture that we saw in chapter 1, where misuse of the tongue, lying, 
is accepted, it's commonplace. In contrast to the pagan, the Christian was to show that when Jesus is your master, he masters your tongue. James has a lot to say about that, doesn't he? That that most smallest of organs in our body, our tongue. If you see Pastor John later, you'll see that he's got a mauve tongue for some reason today. I'll let him explain why that is. But this tongue, James says it can set a forest on fire, can't it? And we know, we know, there are some families today where Mothering Sunday will not be being celebrated because a family has been torn apart by people's misuse of their tongue. If your tongue is under control, you're under control. That's the Bible's perspective. You see, the self-control is about controlling what comes out of here because what comes out of here comes out of here, out of our heart, and our heart needs to be under God's control. Your appetite's not addicted to much wine. Now in Crete, under the lazy Mediterranean sun, the wine flowed freely. The alcohol provided a quick and easy release, as it does today in our culture. There's, there's few things sadder, isn't there, when people, men, women of all ages, but especially younger men, younger women, have to turn to alcohol to dull the pain of life, to drown out their sorrows in the sea of for temporary forgetfulness. It's not just wine, of course, it's tranquilizers, it's shopping binges, it's soap operas. They can be addictive routes. Life now, as then, can be harsh, it can be cruel. And whether you're privileged or vulnerable in society, you're affected by this. There's as much alcoholism amongst the privileged as there is amongst the underprivileged. But Paul is saying, look, in that prevailing culture, here's the distinctiveness, particularly of a Christian woman. Their appetites are under control because grace has brought about a great change. And there is truth to be taught. You see, in the gospel, God pours out his grace, his goodness into our lives. And the thing that will keep us going is the truth, the sound doctrine, the gospel. Every day I need to be helped to bring my mind in line with God's mind. My ways in line with God's ways. It's only the gospel that will do that. But we can help one another do that. And the great role of older women is to come alongside younger women. And in similar fashion, I was talking about the men. Just to, to mentor them. Just to be there for them. Somebody to talk to. I'm sure that's going on already, um, probably quite informally in many ways. I hope it is in the life of the church. I just want to encourage us, as the Bible does, to do that more and more. And you may say, oh, I've got nothing to give. I'm an older woman. I've got nothing. You've got masses to give. Are you a Christian? Have you been on the Christian track for 10, 20, 30, 40 years? It's a miracle. A miracle of God's goodness. You've got something to say. You've got something to share. You see, this teaching must be done women to women, man to man. To live the gospel, to teach the gospel. And finally, a ministry to younger women. It's interesting, isn't it? There in verse 5. Teach the younger women to be self-controlled, pure, busy at home, be kind, be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. When you think about it, those, those, those words seem, well, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Teach me to be kind, to be a good, good wife. Wouldn't that come instinctively? Well, yes, but it always comes shaped by the culture. See, if the culture's telling you you must fulfill yourself, then it will despise the role of a mother or a wife. Those times when... People say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm just a mum. At that point, it would be totally inappropriate, but I just want to get hold of them and say, just a mum? That's the greatest calling in the world. You're not just a mum, you're a mum. One of life's great callings to nurture and shape a young life. What do you do? Oh, I'm just a housewife. No, that's a great calling to create a home, an environment of love and receptivity and kindness and goodness. 
in the culture we live in, that is so needed. There are hundreds, thousands of children and young people growing up in our culture where they don't have that. We take it for granted. We, these things are normal to us as Christians. We must realize they're abnormal in the culture. But what a role model. What an example. What a welcoming place for people to come to Christ. They provide. Teach them to be self-controlled and pure. In, age, in days of sexual <coughs> promiscuity, the need for sexual purity amongst Christians is vital. And we know we primarily apply that to men, but here he's applying it to women as well, isn't he? You see, if you're out at work, if you're in a place, if you're at school, where people are bombarding you and saying, this is what it means, just be free with your body, just have sex whenever you want to, and so on. Sooner or later, that, that dripping tap begins to impact you. And we fool ourselves to think it, it won't happen. And if we've been around long enough, we know, sadly, it happens in churches. And Paul is saying, no, here's a great role model that older women could be. To say to a young woman, do you know, I'm not, I'm not sure you're altogether entirely appropriately dressed. Because you know the way you're dressing? That's arousing men. You may not realize that. You may realize, and that's what your purpose is. We just need to help one another in that. A bloke can't say that to a, to a woman, to a girl, but an older woman can. And we should be encouraging that, shouldn't we? We should so understand that what we say is out of love. It's wanting the best for one another. That we should be open to that. John asked me in that interview what the one things I've learned. As afterwards, I think of lots of other things I could have said. But I think the one thing I've learned is this. I've learned over the years that I need to ask myself this question. What is it about myself that I don't see that other people glaring, it's glaringly obvious to other people? And we're all like that. You see, we don't see ourselves. We see ourselves as we imagine we are. <laughs> we don't see ourselves as we really are. We need somebody in our life, somebody who's near enough to us close enough to us to take that speck out of our eye, because it's a delicate thing, who can choose the time to say, Trevor, do you realize this is what you're like? I thank God for people who've come and said that to me. I've not intended to be like that. I've not even realized. But that's a great lesson to learn, isn't it? What is the element of truth in what somebody is saying to me about me that I don't see? If you can learn to ask yourself that question, it opens yourself up to the work of the Spirit of God to cause repentance, to turn us around, to change us. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. So brothers and sisters, what a great calling, what a great privilege it is to be a Christian. What a great company of people God has given us. This hall is full. Brothers and sisters, most, most part are Christians. What power we can be into one another's lives, into the lives of the younger people for the glory of God. You're never too old, and sometimes you're never too young just to role model it to somebody who's a bit younger. May God do that work in our midst for his glory. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the immense practicality of your, of your word. We thank you for this little letter of Paul to, the, to Titus. We think of that uh, island that we know today as a, a place of holiday resort, but then was a place of, of a, a culture which is so similar to ourselves. And yet in the midst of it, you were going to create a miracle. You were going to bring men and women, boys and girls, to yourself, change them from the inside out, put them on display as role models, as examples of what it is to be a Christian. Lord. Wherever you take us tomorrow morning, whether it's in the home, whether it's a school gate, whether it's into a school or college, university, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's among our neighbours, whether it's in the sports clubs we attend, whatever it may be, Lord, help us to be godly role models. People who are authentic, who are real, genuine, 
humble in our love for you and our love for other people. Forgive our many failings, but don't let us stay with those failings. Help us, Lord, to see that you have plans to use even us for your glory. We ask this for the glory of Christ, for the extension of his kingdom in this place, through this church, for your glory. Amen. Amen. Great. We're going to sing a final hymn, which I chose and I have forgotten what it is now. So, Church, arise and put your armour on. That's the one. Thank you. Oh, please stand, church, as we uh, start to play. remain standing as we come to the end of our service. I was struck by what is written in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about a cloud of witnesses, obviously talking about many people through the Old Testament as cloud of witnesses, but we've got Christians in our own lives who we can look at and also see how they were stirred and how God used them, and in Hebrews 12, therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in Jesus we have the perfect role model. Lord, we are fallen, sinful beings, young, old, men, women. Yet, Lord, we thank you that through Jesus we have that perfection to look to who is seated at the right hand of you. And we thank you that Jesus is at work in our lives by your spirit. Lord, change us to be the people you would have us be, not for our glory, but for yours, that you alone receive all the glory. Lord, please help us in this. And may this message, may your word dwell in our hearts and, and stir us on this week to love and good works that we may point people to Christ as you're at work in our lives. So Lord, please help us, we pray, for your name and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.